My name is Rupal Bapit, and I am uh, the Deputy Commissioner of Public, uh, vehicle, Public Passenger Vehicle Operations, Licensing and Operations. Our offices are at 2350 West Ogden. That's where we license all public passenger vehicles. Um, public passenger vehicles include taxis, liveries, horse-drawn carriages, and now they include pedicabs. Um, I just want to get an idea how many people here are actually in the pedicab industry right now. Okay, well, I'm glad you made it. Um, so I wanted to, I'm gonna just go and do, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the pedicab industry. Um, it is a new industry. I, I mean, it's, their pedicab operators have been operating for several years, but it's a new, um, it's a new license that the city of Chicago implemented this summer. So the ordinance is in effect, and the ordinance is under municipal code chapter section uh, chapter 9-110 and it is in effect and it does require pedicab um, like pedicab industry to be licensed now there's a, a fact sheet I want if you there's a fact sheet that's up here that basically just summarizes the basics about the pedicab industry um, another important part of this fact sheet and actually a lot of the literature that's up here is knowing our contact email address the contact email address, it's, it's on the fact sheet. It's also on our uh, checklist for pedicab chauffeur. It's uh, and mostly all of our public passenger vehicle documents. If anybody ever has a question or what, would like to um, enroll, we have a free email service about the pu public passenger industry world. You just have to send an email. The email is bacppv at cityofchicago.org. Um, you know, basic things about the pedicab industry. There's actually two licenses. There's the um, pedicab vehicle itself that needs a license and the pedicab chauffeur. So the pedicab vehicle, each vehicle needs a license and it's obtained by either the owner or the person that has control over the pedicab, um, the bicyclist. How many people know what a pedicab is here? Okay, everybody knows what a pedicab, you've seen them on the streets. Um, so you see that it's actually pedal powered. It's not a, there's no combustion engine. It's a pedal power vehicle, but it is a public passenger vehicle because you have what we call a chauffeur. In order to have a public passenger vehicle, you need a chauffeur who's the, in the pedicab, it's a pedicab chauffeur that's doing the pedaling, and the transportation has to be for hire. That means the passengers are paying the chauffeur to transport them from one destination to another. So horse-drawn carriages are also public passenger vehicles, taxis, liveries, um, you know, even water taxis, we, could, they're, we license them too. They're public passenger vehicles because you have a captain who's the chauffeur. So, so the pedicab industry needs two uh, licenses. One is for the vehicle itself, and that's called, we call it the pedicab license. It's $250, there's an application form here, which includes instructions on how to apply. It does include um, it, the pedicab vehicle has to meet some requirements as far as safety. Um, the vehicle itself. Also, there's dimensions that are um, restricted by the ordinance, and there's operating restrictions. Um, you know, pedicabs cannot operate on Michigan Avenue and State Street between Oak and Congress on. Um, like I'm trying to, I'm in a blank right now on the dates, but on certain days of the uh, of the week, they Monday can't. Friday um, on the on the weekday, it's from like six to eight in the morning and four to six in the evening in the loop. Okay. Yeah. That's the best thing about having participation from the audience. It, it helps the those presenter out when they are draw a blank. Thank you for that. Um, you know, so it has restrictions, and the the fact sheet goes through them. Now the other license that's required is actually the person that's um, pedaling the pedicab and that we call that a chauffeur, a pedicab chauffeur. So you have to be 18 years old, you need to have a driver's license, you go through a criminal background check, you have to pass a drug test, and there's an application process for that. There's also an exam for that. And we offer the exam, it's a free exam, it's offered at 2350 West Ogden on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You just have to email us in advance and say I want to sign up for the exam, you show up and you you, you know, and you take the exam, and right now we have a very uh, high pass rate. So it seems that people are preparing and, and passing first time. <coughs> um, so that's the, those are the basic 
licenses that are involved. Everything, I also want, since we're here, I wanted to go through and just show you, we actually have a dedicated web page just on pedicabs. Me. So I need your help, Regina. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, here we go. It's back up. So we have a main, let me go to our department web, web page. Our um, department web page is City of Chicago org backslash BACP. This department's name is Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. We, we um, try and keep everything we do very public and accessible to anybody that needs access to it. So if you go to featured services and programs, those are the four main categories of our, my department. Uh, public vehicle licenses is what Pedicamps falls under. You could click that uh, icon. You can also go to show all and you get this whole page of nifty little icons and if you go at the end you see a little pedicab icon. You click on that and you get to our page, our pedicab uh, page. All new information, all the forms that we have here are all on that page. So we try to keep everything accessible to anybody that's interested in this industry. Um, you know, we do have over, right now we have over 30, um, 30, around 30, 35 pedicab chauffeurs that are licensed. We have more applying every day. Um, so we are seeing people come in, getting the license successfully, and um, we issue a license uh, card, just like a, a taxi cab card. It, has, it says pedicab chauffeur, it has the, uh, um, the licensee's photo on it, name, and their chauffeur number and they're uh, the pedicab chauffeurs are, are to display it at all times they could wear it like on an ID badge or clip it on it themselves for pedicab uh, licenses we do have applications and I wanted to just I brought a couple things when um, we just got these in these are the pedicab license plates so this is what the license pedicabs are gonna have on their um, the rear just like a, a any kind of vehicle this, is, this happens to be pedicab license 100. We also have these ready to go. These are stickers that are gonna be on the back of, or it uh, doesn't have to be in the rear, but it has to be displayed conspicuously. So just like taxis have call 311, this is um, so do, actually sort of horse-drawn carriages. They have similar little stickers or uh, weatherproof decals. This one says pedicab number. We'll put it in a permanent marker. When we issue the licenses, the licensees will get the license plate, they'll get this. They'll also get a little decal sticker to, um, to put on. The license plates are permanent. That means you don't, you don't change these every year. They're just like regular vehicle license plates when they're issued. This is permanent um, for as long as that person wants to operate the pedicab. Uh, we don't replace these every year. The only things we will replace is the actual decal, which is a little sticker that will get replaced every year when the person renews their license. The, um, three, this little sticker, like I said, it's weatherproof. It just says pedicab number, call 311 to report compliments or complaints. So it, it, we're being consistent with what we do in all other public passenger vehicle industries because um, horse-drawn carriages also have license plates. Um, obviously, cars have license plates, the so taxi deliveries, and they all have these kind of little call 311 stickers. Um, since there's two pedicab licensees here, I wanted to open this up too for questions and answers. Um, like, you know, if there's any questions you have about the process or um, just any questions at all. Because I, I didn't want to restate everything that we already have in literature necessarily. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, um, on more of the progress there of uh, with involving the insurance, because uh, from my understanding with our insurance agent, he said that, that what the city's asking is kind of something that like they're having difficulty providing, and so that's been kind of brought back to the city to review. Okay. How is that coming along? Okay, so that, that's actually a good question. Um, yes, there. I'm gonna just let me pull out the insurance requirement. That this has been. Um, we're actually working with the insurance companies that have submitted um, certific certificates of insurance on behalf of their clients. So under the uh, municipal code 9110080, insurance required, it says every licensee 
must comply with all applicable insurance require, requirements mandated by federal, state of Illinois, and city laws. So that that simple sentence has been the well, an issue, and it, it's a it's a like one sentence, and you think it wouldn't be an issue, but it seems to have been an issue for the insurance providers in the pedicab industry, and. The, so this is consistent with requirements in all other public passenger vehicles. The insurance that is obtained for the vehicle, we want to make sure that it meets federal, state, and city yeah. standards. And so for the pedicab industry, um, it is a new license, so it's a new process, I have to be honest, with the people that license public passenger vehicles. Um, it's been a learning process for us as far as insurance, because insurance is different in the other industries that we deal with. Um, in taxis and libraries, the insurance policies mandated by the state have to be state of Illinois licensed insurance policies. Well, it turns out in the pedicab industry, you don't need a state of Illinois licensed insurance company. So if, it, if, if any pedicab licensee does secure insurance from a licensed state of Illinois insurance provider, they comply with that sentence. Okay, so that has been the issue. So the insurance policies we've been receiving and the, the insurance companies we're dealing with, they're not licensed by the state of Illinois. It's actually called something, uh, the insurance is called surplus lines insurance, which is permissible in Illinois. It's just not licensed by the state of Illinois Department of Insurance. So that was a learning curve for us, I have to be honest with you. And it was a learning curve also for these insurance companies um, and, and how to deal with us. Because a lot of these insurance companies have never dealt with our department or city regulations, so the so the we've we've tried to you know work with the insurance companies. Right now, all we're requesting is a certificate of insurance. Most of them have had no issue meeting all the other requirements. As far well, uh, actually, a lot of the coverage we see is way in excess two, of two million dollars. yes, it's yeah. excess of what we require. Yeah. So they've. Um, gotten way beyond our requirements. You know, our requirement, the insurance policy uh, for each cap, pedicab is 50,000 for property damage, 100,000 for insurance uh, injuries or death of one person, 300,000 for injuries to death of more than one person. And um, so what we've been seeing is way beyond this. You're right, like $2 million, yeah. which is great. So the coverage has not been an issue, all right? The um, coverage has not been an issue. The other the, so the only thing that we require these insurance providers to do on the certificate of insurance is just have a sentence that they, they are complying their insurance and what they're doing as a provider does comply with all federal, city, state laws. That's what we're asking them to put on the certificate of insurance. So we actually had, and we've been working with the insurance company, so we've been reaching out to them. Some of them have been not um, quick to respond. They're taking weeks to respond, so we reach out again. You know, we've been trying to actively be very proactive about this. We did have one insurance company um, that actually is a provider for a lot of the applicants to give us something the finally with it. Guy. I don't know the name. I don't yeah, want to say that name. I don't want to say that insurance company's name, but we did get a certificate that finally has a sentence in it. And um, I think they had some typos, but that was it. And so we just asked them to fix the typos. And so we're, we'll be able to issue those, you know, our, our, our nifty little license plates and the, the decals going forward. Yeah. Um, the other requirement the certificate of insurance policy should have is um, the notice policy, OK? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, you know, and we understand that 60 days, now we understand that now that 60 days is not possible. So we're accepting anything um, 10, 10 days even. So if there's a cancellation of the policy, as long as it, it has to say that. So we've been accepting that, and we've actually, um, we have, um, we're going to be requesting that that section be changed in the ordinance. Because now, like I said, it's a new license, it's a new process for us, we are learning a lot, and one thing we've learned is that this is just not applicable in this industry, so we're gonna work with the insurance and the license applicants to, um, to make sure that we could license them. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so if you're, if you, you know, it'd be helpful if you reach out to your insurance provider yeah, and make sure that they're reaching out to us because um, Monique Davids, an attorney with the department I work with, she's been dealing directly with these insurance companies and stuff. So um, we've been trying to be very proactive about that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's, he, he, the, my insurance guy actually gave me a lot of feedback and just said that he had been working with you guys on that. 
I was just curious how it was coming along. So yeah, so it's they've been some of them have not been um, like I said they, they didn't respond right away and we've had to like reach out like, two three times to say hey did you get our emails and what's going on? And I guess my other question is is that some of the guys have had difficulty registering their LLC and they've opted just to end up, end up registering as an individual. Is it not really preferred by the Consumer Affairs that we have an LLC or is it just a Bigger stack of papers to fill out. Okay, so if you want to, basically, an LLC is something that you deal with the state of Illinois mm -hmm. and um, their Department of Business Services. Okay. So that's not something that you deal with us. I mean, it's okay. it's going to be the individual business owner's choice. Some business owners don't choose to incorporate. They don't choose to be an LLC. Um, an <laughs> LLC is limited liability corporation. Right. I mean, you can just apply for the license straight out as a person. Okay. okay? Um, you don't have to. It, it, we have that. I mean, it's in our ordinance. It has different provisions. If you're an individual applicant, these are the requirements. If you're um, a corporate applicant, these are the requirements. Okay. So it's up to you as a licensed applicant to decide what is best for your business. Okay. It's not something that we get involved in, and we don't give you advice on that. Okay. That's something that's a, a, a beyond the licensing aspect. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Dan? So, uh, you go over what happens if you don't have a license? Well, um, there's a, a fine, unlicensed operation, that there's a fine, and there's a possibility of impoundment. Um, just so, be, so it's clear, we have not started licensing enforcement. The only enforcement that's currently in place is the operations enforcement. And that's mostly for public safety. So things like um, pedicabs may not operate in the loop during weekday rush hours between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. and between 4 and 6 p.m. Pedicabs may not operate on Michigan Avenue and State Street from Congress Parkway to Oak Street. Um, you can't have alcohol on the pedicab, either for the passenger or for yourself. Um, fares must be visibly posted. Um, pedicab passengers must remain seated at all times. Well, it's moving. So these are public safety issues. Um, Petty cabs may not operate on sidewalks. We have not started the enforcement as far as licensing, just operating operations as far as those streets, things like that. So uh, you're doing enforcement on who are not licensed. Those kind of, that kind of enforcement would be. This is for anybody. This is anybody like licenses, but nobody's being cited right now for not having. No, police are not looking. For, not asking for a chauffeur license at this point. They're not looking for the license plates at this point. We will be rolling that out shortly. When we roll it out, we'll probably send out an industry notice saying, hey, you know, it's not going to come as a surprise. We, that's why I encourage everybody to sign up for our industry notices. It's free, BACPPV at cityofchicago.org. It's in all of our literature. It's even on the fact sheet. It says, you know, keep informed, sign up for our industry notices. So when we did start the enforcement as far as the operating procedures, we sent out an industry notice and we communicated to as many pedicab licensees as we could that, you know what, you, gotta, you can't be on Michigan Avenue, you can't be on um, State Street, you know, rush hour operations, things like that. You know, make sure there's no alcohol, make sure people are seated. So we, we did start, when we did that, before we did, we, made it, we did make an announcement. And when we enforced the licensing, we will make an announcement. We'll send out an industry notice, and then um, police will and investigators will start the process. We understand, you know, licensing process is new. Um, it's new for us. It's new for you. We're trying to work with the industry to give them time. But you know, we have already over 30 chauffeurs that are pedicab chauffeurs. So people are coming in every week, taking the exam. We're seeing, you know, more and more um, the hiccup as far as issuing the. The only really hiccup about the issuing these license plates has been the insurance issue. So it looks like now we're, we're coming to a point where that is going to be resolved pretty quickly by the insurance providers and we will be contacting the applicants, having them come in and pick up the license plate and the decals. Okay, so hopefully that's going to roll out pretty soon. As soon as we get those certificates of insurance that comply with the ordinance, that's the only, that's been the only hiccup. Uh, I mean, there's been other hiccups that have nothing to do with insurance. I have to tell you the, another issue that's been happening is when we get the applications, 
This is the application form and there's instructions for it. Um, here, the license is the packet. Uh, people aren't reading the questions when they're filling them out. One of the requirements is you're supposed to submit a photograph of the pedicab. People are actually submitting the photograph, but there's a, there's a question, what's the color of the pedicab? They'll put red and the photograph is blue. So then we have to call them in because they're attesting to this. Under penalties as provided by law, I certify the above statements are true and correct. I'm not joking. This has happened repeatedly. That, you know, I, I understand, you know, there's a couple licensees are making multiple copies, filling it once and making multiple copies and then not paying attention to the photographs they're attaching. We have to call these people in like, okay, you have to fix this. Or just making mistakes, you know. Um, we have somebody that actually didn't give us phone numbers or an email address that we can reach that person at. And we've been trying. So, I mean, we can't issue a license if we can't reach, reach you. Things like that. So, um, that was like the first issue with the applications. I don't know, like, we've been calling you guys, coming back, <laughs> and we're calling you. Actually, we're, you don't have to come back. We're like, you have to resubmit stuff. You know, um, that was the first issue. Once we finally got applications that, um, you know, that matched the pedicab and other things, then we moved on to insurance. And that's in the hiccup right now. But so I encourage people to actually, you know, follow the instructions, read the questions, and, and maybe double check or have somebody else proofread it because when you submit it, it's then it's just like it holds up your application and we have to go back and forth, back and forth with people. So, any other questions about the pedicab chauffeur or the pedicab licensing? So, for people that, can, yes, ma'am. Right now, we don't license any kind of vehicles like that. Okay. But so, I mean, you could, there's just, we don't have a license that fits that for, are you talking about something called a pedal pub? Yes. Okay. We don't have a licensing <clears throat> scheme for that. The, uh, well, currently, you don't. Are there any plans to maybe do something like that? That's my question. Um, not right now. So that's a different, a very different vehicle than the pedicab. Um, so for the alcohol and the pedicab, the restriction is you can't have any open alcohol. I mean, if you have clothes, I mean, if you have, you know, just like in a car, <laughs> you can't have open alcohol. So, yes, sir. Let's bring up an interesting question, though. So if those vehicles are allowed to operate, you know, the pedal pump, and people are allowed to drink in the back of that, why would they then not be allowed to drink in the back of the pedicab? They're not allowed to operate in Chicago. In the city of Chicago, oh, there is no, pe I mean, there is, no there is no pedal pub. I mean, okay. if there is a pedal pub, you could report it and we can oh, right. take enforcement, okay. oh. but it's unlicensed operation at this point. I see. I see. There is one guy, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually allow people to drink on it. He just pedals in the bars. So the pedal pub is a different, it's, it's a different topic than the pedicab and it's not, it, it doesn't meet the size constraints of the pedicab license and so many other things. It's a, a different, it, it's, a, it's an entertainment vehicle, it's not a transportation vehicle. So. Okay. Yes, sir? Yes, on the matter of insurance, just in case that there was a um, accident that happened within, I mean, God forbid, but just in case that there was an accident that happened within within the pedicab or something like that that would injure the passenger or maybe even the, um, the driver himself, is there like an insurance that would help? Right. So there is a mandate on insurance. Yes. So there. That's um. So we're. That's been the hiccup as far as the insurance, as far as issuing licenses. We have to make sure that the insurance coverage meets other requirements in the ordinance. And what we've been seeing is actually the insurance coverage is uh, the policies we've been seeing are way in excess of what we, and the minimum requirements. So you, before we issue a pedicab license, okay. the via, yes, there has to be insurance on the operation of the vehicle. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, 
There was an issue with the 60 versus 30 day cancellation. How was that resolved? Was We're accepting under, under 60 days. We're not um, enforcing the 60 days. We are uh, working with insurance companies. We understand now it's a new license even for us that this kind of, that insurance, um, it, it's just not possible. So we are accepting um, notice under 60 days. Um, I've also uh, proposed that we change that section of the ordinance, okay? Sometimes it takes time to figure out what's gonna work or not. And sometimes yeah. we have to make amendments. So we are working on that. I guess I have a question that's kind of talked about amongst the shops as far as um, like when it comes to turn lights, turning lights. It okay. says turn lights technically in the, in the, in the ordinance. Fine. However, um, it does not say like it says with the brake light or the, the tail lights that it has to be the vehicle width. And so a lot of these guys are skidding when it sits in the center. Is okay. that something that, that is fine? It's okay to have that? Or should it actually be set? Yeah, like, like it says in there, the tail light should be like basically showing the width of the vehicle. Okay, so it says this is what it says. All right, it says functioning tail lights mounted on the right and the left, respectively, at the same level on the rear exterior of the passenger compartment. Tail lights shall be red in color and plain visibly from all distances within 500 feet to the rear of the petty tail. But when it comes to turn signal. Um, should those also be the width of the vehicle, or is, is this little tiny box okay for the vehicle? Okay, it just says turn lights. So it's fine. Okay. So turn lights, it doesn't say like what it says about the tail lights, like left and right, it just says turn lights. Okay. So I guess if you have a center mounted turn light, like one center thing that has like a left arrow or the right arrow, that would comply. Okay. Does cool. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm on camera, so you have that for public <laughs> information. That I said that a center tail light is okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Those are good questions. Any other questions? Any concerns? Okay. How many applications do you have for the petty cat vehicles? We have 76. Uh, I'm sorry, I got here a little bit late. I've had an application for uh, my actual license. It's got to be about uh, over a month at this point. Uh, I got my position by the chauffeur's license. Uh, and yeah, all, I did all that stuff at the same time. So you got your chauffeur license? Yes. You have your petty cap chauffeur license? You just don't have it. Okay. So I haven't heard anything, so I'm just wondering right. so if it's, it's everything fine or. Yes, this, the, it's actually consistently the same issue with all the applications. It's a certificate of insurance. Okay. Um, a majority of the applicants have the same insurance provider, so we've been dealing with them regularly. We're in communication all the time, just to, to, to iron out the certificate of insurance. Okay. Um, we, you know, we are now flexible about the 60 days. That's not going to hold any, you know, it's not going to hold anybody up. The, I, I'll read that section. The one section that we are requesting the certificate of insurance to have um, is this is what we've asked the insurance provider to put on the certificate of insurance. Every licensee must comply with all applicable insurance requirements mandated by federal, state of Illinois and city laws. So we just want the uh, provider to say they are complying with all applicable state, federal, and city laws. And so that's the sentence we're asking them to put on. Okay, uh, I guess my question was, is if I haven't heard anything from them about my, uh, uh, my application yet, I'm probably all set up and ready yeah. to go. Yeah, sure. awesome. we, if, uh, if, if we actually deny an application, you get something in writing. Okay. We're in, everything is in a whole pattern until this insurance certificate is, is ironed out, okay. and it looks like we're almost there now. Okay, great. Uh, also, the IRIS decal, is that something that goes for City Hall, or do we do that for you as well? Okay, you're talking about the... Um, the insurance, like, you have to have a decal that says you are paying a dollar a day. Okay, we have... If, if any, we have actually a guest speaker from Department of Finance, okay. that he, his, their weed is gonna talk about um, ground transportation tax. Okay. We have a handout from Department of Finance on that. Um, is there uh, any other questions about licensing at all? Yes. Um, if you have a time table on when you're gonna be ready to enforce the entire thing, yeah. you're only enforcing the uh, couple of things right now? Right, we'll set out an industry notice. We'll give people advance notice. You know, we want people to get licensed um, probably once 
the, you know, um, it's not been any, it's not been the fault of the applicants why we haven't issued the insurance. Uh, I'm sorry, the the pedicab licenses. It's been the issue with the insurance. So we've been dealing with the insurance providers. Once that's resolved, then we actually can issue license plates. There's no point in, in starting licensing enforcement if we can't give license plates out yet. And they're going to be that big? This is it. Oh, got it. <laughs> They'll fit. I, I, I've tested it. <laughs> They'll fit. The, the caboose is big enough for this. So um, it's going to fit. So we'll be giving these out. You know, There's no point in enforcing licensing if you can't show that you're licensed. Does that have to go in the back to your head yes. off the bottom of it? Or as long as it's visible. Okay. It should be in the back. It can hang, it has to be visible, so people know that you're licensed. If by any chance, say somebody uh, steals your license plate, you know, for fun or whatever, uh, is that, are they replaceable? Yeah, they're replaceable. Okay. They're people replaceable. do love to steal stuff off of our bikes. Yes, it's, it's, kind, of <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> well, you, you know, if you really, it has to be mounted while you're in operation. If you're parked, if you want to take it out so nobody steals it, that's fine. I mean, it, when you're operating, it should be well, I, I, was, I was under the, uh, the understanding that it had to be permanently affixed to the pen cap. While it's in operation. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll reread the ordinance about that. If, you know, we have a, we're pretty responsive about questions. Email us at the ACP TV at cityofchicago.org. Okay. Email us if you have questions like that. So um, if you're concerned about people stealing them, and if we see that that's a pattern, you know, we'll talk to the police about you know, about enforcing an operation versus when it's parked. We'll look into that if that becomes an issue. But they are replaced. I mean, we could order more. And in the meantime, I mean, we have this issue in other industry. We give it, this is the same size as a horse-drawn carriage um, plate. But um, like medallions or taxi cabs, sometimes they get stolen. We, what we do is we give a letter to operate because it takes time for us to get, you know, this gets made by a vendor that has to make the plate and imprint it. So, while we're waiting for the plate to come in, we give a letter to operate, so the licensee can always show that they're licensed. And do you, do you have a replacement fee set up? I think there is, it's like 20 bucks or something. Okay. It's consistent with other um, plates, replacement fees. Any other questions about pedicab licensing? Yes, sir. I just have a question about the driver's license requirement, the one year. Right. Um, does that have to be continuous? Yeah, one continuous year. So, you had a gap in the last year. Let's say you've had a, a license for like 20 years. Okay. So in the last 12 months, you had a gap of like a couple of months where you didn't have a license. Like you didn't renew it on time. Then you have to wait a year? No, why don't we, if you, when you apply, we look at that. And we, we also, we also um, contact the Secretary of State to find out about the gap and things like that. Small gaps sometimes will, um, you know, if it's a small gap and there's no gap for a long, <coughs> period of time or for you know, like a suspension or something because I should say we might just you know you know just take the gap for what it was and maybe an error or something on the licensing part did you apply for a chauffeur license and are you facing that issue a few people are I mean people have gotten their licenses though despite the gap pardon so some people I think people have gotten licenses despite the gap right so right so we work with the okay. you know it's a case-by-case -case situation I do have a question in regards to that because I lost a couple drivers because of that. Like they were going to go apply to get their driver's license because they said to sit on it for a year. Um, is there something that some chance that we could possibly put into place in the future? Something like the taxi cabs where you can go and take the eight hour course and the two hour uh, defensive or whatever the driving assessment? We can look into that. You could propose that and we can, you know, look into that. Any other questions on licensing? Okay, so you know, make sure you pick up our fact sheet. It has our contact information if you have any questions. We have the, uh, the application for the chauffeur license and for the pedicab license up here. And now I'm gonna introduce Dale Reed from Department of Finance, who's gonna uh, talk about uh, ground transportation tax and pedicabs. And you can also use, uh, do you wanna go to Department of Finance website? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, actually, uh, my name is Daryl Reed. I'm a manager over in the Department of Finance and the Tax Division, and we work with BACP's office. Um, you know, with a lot of tax compliance um, 
issues and we work of course with the uh, public as well to help them resolve their tax issues. Um, but the pedicab, um, which is a new tax, um, which after, basically after, you guys, after the licenses are issued, and then that's when you guys come into contact with our office, okay? Because we need to set up your account, um, which you have your own Iris account, where you have your, your uh, pedicab license on that account. So we'll also register your account for the ground transportation tax. Um, be aware that the tax is $1 for each pedicab for each day that you're providing ground transportation service uh, here in the city of Chicago. Okay. Once you're registered for the tax, what our office will do uh, once we get um, contacted by probably Monique from BACP that you do have a license, someone from our office will contact you. More likely they will send you an email basically indicating that you're now registered for the ground transportation tax and they'll also in that email send you your uh, tax web pin. So you have your own unique pin number that you can use to go into our City of Chicago website to begin making your monthly payments. Uh, your monthly payments are due on the 15th of the following month. So for instance, if you have a liability for the month of July, your tax payment is due by August 15th. Okay? And all that is explained in the email that you will receive uh, from our office. And then annually, of course, there's a tax return that you'll need to file as well, uh, which you can also file online. I'm actually going to show you the uh, website uh, where you can actually file the return and make your payment. Okay. So, Go to pay for. Do so we have any questions so far? Uh, <clears throat> Instead of having to go through the whole rigmarole, you know, doing a monthly payment, we just you know, forget it. We're going to pay $365 and just pay it. Pay it up front? Yes. yes, you can do that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can do that. And actually, uh, I'm sorry, question in the back. Yeah, what well, normally, right, the payments are due monthly. However, we think that a lot of uh, the payers, if your liability is less than $1,200 for the current tax period, the following year you can just pay it annually. Okay, so that's okay, an so option as gonna, well. So yes. you're going to have to, the first year you are going to have to do the monthly Yeah, payments. make the monthly payments, yeah. Uh, kind of advise you to make the monthly payments, and then after that annual, going forward, as long as your liability is less than $1,200, then you can pay it annually. Yes. Um, because of the weather, uh, pickups are only, I mean, I, I only operate six months of the year. Okay. And from the other five, six months of the year, I close shop. Okay. So, what's the, how would you resolve the issue with tax when you close shop and you're not operating from, let's say, December to May? Mm -hmm. Well, annual tax period goes from July 1st through June 30th of the following year. So if there's no, if you're not providing any ground transportation service to the public, of course, you're not expected to make a payment. So when you file your return, you won't report any liability for those months. You'll just report the liability for the months that you actually provided ground transportation services for. Would it be a special paperwork that I have to submit? To no, show no, you don't I'm have to show. That I close shop? No. Like bills, it's like the shop's closed. No. no, no. How well we do recommend because um, that you keep records because another um, area of our tax office is the enforcement, and that leads into an audit that could happen. So we require you to keep records. But as long as you're just making payments or not making payments and filing your return, it's all done in good faith. Okay. So if you don't make a payment, we're not expecting you to report a liability for that month when you file your return. It's just like income tax return, you file it in good faith, and then if you get audited, you're gonna have to show the your documentation to support what you filed. And the return is annual? Yes. Yes. So if you get audited, that's when you can show you were, you know, you were in Florida or whatever during the winter months. And right. if you weren't in operation. This is an Illinois uh, state tax. City, city of Chicago. This is all, yeah. Okay. Speaking the city of Chicago ground okay. transportation. That, that is a question that our accountant had was saying, would you notice if there is a state tax for us as well? Uh, or is it just city tax and federal? And 
there's not really a state track that goes towards ground transportation? Not that I'm aware of. I'm only speaking just for a city. Okay. And then second off, um, like sign-in logs for our drivers whenever they, they come in. Let's say they only work, they, they signed up for a week, but they only work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. They sign in and out. Mm -hmm. That's the only days we actually have to pay for as long as we can prove that to you guys. Exactly, okay. yes. Yes, that's why I um, stated that it's imperative that you keep good records uh, for your drivers as well as yourself uh, in the event that you are ever audited in the future. So it's a dollar per day per bike, right? Yes, this is right. It's a dollar. It's one dollar for each pedicab for each day the pedicab is used in the city to provide ground transportation services. Uh, and any other questions? I, I, so I yes. know some of the pedicabs will do a special tour with a chamber of commerce, so there's no charge. Are they still subject to that dollar a day tax? So they are. So if they're if they're doing something for like a private tour, for example, like the Lake Louise Chamber of Commerce has, has hired drivers. They're not actually. The right, so they're not charging. They're, they're, they're working on behalf of a, of a different organization. Do they still have to pay the dollar? That's something we have to look into okay. to see whether that is actual taxable activity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there. Can I ask you a question? Like, so when they're doing a special event like that, is there like a flat rate the petty cab for? Is getting from the chamber of commerce to provide the yes. Yes. yes, the organizer would pay for you know, five cabs for. Okay, so there's like a flat rate. It's just not per like per passenger, right? Right. So right. they are being so it's it's still considered public passenger for hire, okay. even if it's not like you know it's a contracted service to provide you know a tour or something, and it's not that's still I think that you still have to pay transportation tax. Yeah, I'm thinking that yes. Versus doing it for free. Let's say if you're doing it for free, if you're just taking your you know, family around for a tour, you're charging them, then you don't need a buddy cab license. I doubt you have to pay a tax if you're just doing it for free. If you're getting any kind of compensation, you're going to hire. And you need a buddy cab license, you need a chauffeur license, and then you need to take a car compensation down. Okay. Any tax? I actually want to just show you a demo of our tax web uh, website. Actually, currently, um, businesses are using this website. I mean, it's been in existence for about seven years now. So we have businesses that are both filing and paying online, and the percentage rate right now is around 80 to 85% for both paying and filing. The good thing about that is that there was no uh, law that had to be passed by city council in order to um, or force upon people the uh, filing and paying online. So this was kind of done. People, they get their PIN number, their account number, they just go in and they just start making their payment and they file their return. They get used to paying and filing. So, um, and again, here, this is where you see you need your account number, which I'll just enter in one of the demo for us. At this point, none of you have account numbers because you don't have a license. Right. So you're right now, you're not, you don't have to worry about reporting back I was told by one of the uh, uh, officers of the CPD guys uh, that if we, once the uh, IRS thing goes into effect, if we don't have that decal, they have no choice. They are forced to impound our cab and you know, take it away and um, all kinds of other nasty stuff. So for ground transportation tax, there's a decal that you issue? That's for the uh, MPA, the airport departure. With decal, I'm not. I was, I was told there's going to be an iris decal. There's going to be a. No. I, there is going to be a decal that we issue. I thought there was two. Okay. From no, I don't think you get. No. There, I don't think there's anything like a ground transportation decal. No. no. They, I don't think there are forget the airport. That's the okay. PA is the right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> right. That's what. Like yeah. That, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Decal that the ACP issues for public passenger vehicles. 
If you next time you see horse drawn carriage, you'll see their decal. Mm -hmm. You'll see it on liveries. You'll see it on. That's a decal we um, change every year, and they'll have the licensing term. Okay. We'll have the date of you know the license is, is in effect, and that's the that's that's this decal. But it, we don't wish. Maybe this CPD calls it an iris decal, but okay. it doesn't have an iris number on it. It just okay. says you, wherever. The iris number is not your license number. Okay. Iris number is it? Is it? Um, yeah, I was just curious. About it's like a tax okay. ID number. That's all it is. Okay. We don't put it on any documentation that you put over your car, and because you need that number to log into the Yeah, portal. no, no, I was, I, was, I was specifically talking about that. So you'll I think get there that was some kind of, in, I think there was some kind of misunderstanding that, that the officer thought there was going to be an iris decal. I like, so look, there's going to be two. He's like, yeah, because we have to have this iris one. One thing about the uh, decal for me, guys, is is that another like application process? No, or is we no, just, like, don't come no, and pay for it? no, the apply, no, you don't get, you don't pay for it. Your 250 covers the okay. license plate, got puts a decal, okay. and then your one sticker. All right. It's all part of the, you know, if you lose it, or it, then you have to pay a replacement fee. Okay. But the every, the license plate, um, you know, that's good forever. Okay. That does not, that there's no gear on it. So oh. mine is your <laughs> license, we don't issue any license plate every year. That's your license plate, it's permanent. If you change the carriage or the license plate gets damaged or stolen, you could pay for a replacement. Okay. The decal, every every when you renew your license, we give you a new decal. Gotcha. That's, so, yeah. And that's part of your license renewal fee. It's part of the 250. Okay. Sorry, Daryl. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this is the uh, MyTax uh, website. Again, like I say it is that once you uh, initiate your license, um, one of these offices will contact our office and we'll uh, register you for the ground transportation tax and we'll basically set up your account so that you can go in and start making your monthly payments. Okay? And this is just uh, on the left here, you can see it says file return, on the right it says make a payment. I uh, just click pay now. Select the tax, which is the ground transportation tax. I'm just using this account as an example, but you'll see the same thing as ground transportation tax. You click pay now, and what happens is that you'll see your monthly, what we call charges <coughs> for each of the months from July through June of the following year. So it should be, in this example here, you see here in the payment period, July, August, September and also gives the due date here as well. So you just go on and select the entering the amount you want to pay into that field and then the next screen that will come up will ask you do you want to pay by check or credit card. <coughs> so this is really similar to making a transaction just online as if you were purchasing something. Okay. Um, and again this is just to give you an idea of what you'll see when you start making and remitting your payments. Okay. Do you happen to know if there's a surcharge? No there's no there's no uh, charge for getting registered for the tax or making your monthly payments and filing the return. Yeah. Pay, like, via PayPal or you know, whatever? Um, no, it was, hold on a second here. Yeah. It's not PayPal. There's just a, um, we have a site here, like, again, so you enter your account number for your bank account, your routing number, bank account number. Well, uh, you don't have a bank account. Then there is an option you can pay by credit card on here as well. The last resort is that we can send you your payment coupons, hard copies, um, as a last resort. And on that payment coupon, there's our tax lockbox address. So you just tear off the bottom of the coupon, uh, make out the check, and send that coupon and check to our tax lockbox address, and they'll process it. But again, we always prefer this method because it's paperless, it's easy, it's convenient. So we try and encourage taxpayers to use our online system. And like I said, we we're up to 80% on both filing and paying so far. So, I mean, it's a very user-friendly site. Uh, but, you know, once again, if you don't have a bank account, therefore you don't have a credit card or a checking account. Oh, well, you, can, then, then you can go to City Hall and make your payments at All one right. of the uh, cashiers. If you 
have a payment coupon. You can right. go to any city payment uh, cashier okay. and just pay in cash. Mm -hmm. the, um, I think that we also at Ogden can pay, uh, print out the payment coupon. Yes. So if you, or I don't know, can they do it here on the first floor too? If something yes, they can. Says, on the first floor, yes, they I, can. So if they don't have a payment coupon, can they just go up and say, I want to mm -hmm. pay my car transportation yes. tax? Mm -hmm. You give them your iris account number, your information, mm -hmm. they'll just, the cashier will print out the coupon and then you just pay in cash and then it gets credited to work, your account. We do that at our Ogden facility all the time. We have a cashier there and the staff can print out the payment coupons. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the tax? I mean, the tax for the most part is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, again, it's just based on the uh, tax rate, the $1 for each petty cab. Um, again, I encourage you to keep records um, just in case you have an audit in the future. Okay? That's for day. $1 per day. Yes, yes. Also, the handout is up here as well. Okay. If you're paying by cash, always keep Yes. From the city of Chicago, keep your receipts. Say, for instance, God forbid, you lost your records or didn't keep them. What would be the consequences if you were audited and didn't have any records? So what would uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by not having records, I mean that makes it a little bit more challenging for the auditors. Uh -huh. um, they would just have to work with you to come up with maybe a, a good estimate. Of um, you know what your liability should be. That could be one of the factors as well. That's the yeah, they may ask you for other records, too. Okay. Yeah, like your income tax returns, or yeah, they can ask for those records as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's really the trip logs and, and the things that you keep related to the petty cap industry. That's where we start first. Little note thing on your phone that says I went out. <laughs> There's no yeah. app for that. <laughs> 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 like for not paying on time? Right. Yes, there is a penalty. Yes, well, that's part of it. You've already made payments, and it's determined that you owe some additional monies. Yes, the additional portion that you owe is subject to uh, late penalties and interest. Mm -hmm. We're only talking about a dollar. Uh, right, 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 right. Any other questions? Just, uh, are, are you guys set up? I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone operates a petty in January. Oh, right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, just so that your, your department isn't, oh my gosh, we don't know. Right, no. Fly her automatically. Or. Right. No, 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 it's not that at all. Like I said, once you start filing, uh, paying, well, if you don't pay, it's all done in good faith at this particular time. Okay. And our office is actually located at 333 South State Street, over at the Paul Center. And we're actually down on the opposite hall of the water department on the third floor. But any questions you may have as well, uh, you can contact the customer service. Um, they also take questions as well. They're aware of this new uh, ordinance with the petty cab, and they're also familiar with, um, they can answer the tax questions as well. Okay. No, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for either of us? Just wondering if there's a timetable on, uh, I'm not sure if you've already answered this, uh, if there's a timetable on one of the plates Ready. As soon as we're clear on the insurance, we'll be calling everybody that's applied that qualified and it's time to pick up their license plate, their decal, and the 301 sticker. And if uh, there's any problem with uh, if qualifying, say, if something fell through the cracks, will you we'll call you. I mean, we'll, we'll discuss it with you. Okay. Good. If we can't get in touch with you, <coughs> that's a reason for denial. Because okay. it says you have to give us a phone number and email that we can get in touch with you. And if we try like five times, there's nothing we can do. That's, that's actually a reason to deny. Okay. We can't reach you. Otherwise, we're working with the industry. We're not working actively to deny, deny people. That's the concern. <laughs> yes? I just had a minor question about like the, when you're, I noticed that when you're applying, it says the legal name of your business. Yes. And like, it could be different from your actual name. <coughs> so like, I didn't, 
I know that when you when you when you have a business that's like not your actual name, you have to like go to the state and get your like fictitious name certificate or whatever that is. Um, okay, so. You, Th that's a corporate corp uh, corporation law. That's not. We, we don't get into that. That's individual. As a business owner, you decide if you're going to operate just as yourself. If you are the legal name of the business entity, or if you want to incorporate. If you are going to pick a name that you haven't incorporated or have done an LLC or any anything like that with the state of Illinois Business Services, there is something you have to file, and it's um, an assumed name. I think it's with the Cook County Clerk that you are operating as, I don't know, pedicab, I don't know, whatever, company, but you've not incorporated that, you don't have, and there's no legal records of who, you have to, uh, it's called an assumed name act or something like that. It's like a deep, you're doing business as, and you file it. So then if somebody wants to look up anything about that company, they could at least tie you to the company. So, um, but then you'd have to show that you did that. Like, you know, file it. So it's up to, it's up to you. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, can I just do that like, now if I just go down? I mean, you're in the, I think that you're, you could go to Cook County um, Recorder Deeds or the clerk's office, you're in this building, and you could talk to them about the process. Okay. I think it's a document. So, you know, like Recorder Deeds, um, and anything that's filed with them is a public document. So it has to be a public document that's, like, searchable or people can tie you to the, the company. And you'd have to keep records of that if you choose not to incorporate or um, go through the Secretary of State Business Services process. Yes, uh, sir? I don't know if you covered this already, but is it permissible now for pity cabs to charge a set fare? There is nothing that prevents, there is nothing in the ordinance that actually speaks as to how you charge. What it says is you have to post what you're charging. So basically, so it's like, you know, it's across the board uniform. If you want to charge whatever, you know, $50 per ride, as long as you say that it's on there, so everybody knows what the rate is, that's fine. I mean, if you want to go below, okay, so let's say if you do like a rate, if, if you go below, you know, people are not gonna file complaints. If you go above, they're going to. So it has to do with consumer protection and notice to the consumer. So a passenger knows what they're gonna expect as far as payment at the end of the ride before they get in. Because you also don't wanna deal with that. You don't wanna get and deal with, you know, the passenger you've already, you know, biked, I don't know, 10 miles, you know, I, I, like three people, and then at the end you're like, you know, arguing about what they owe you at this point. So that, I mean, if you have, it's clear what their, the expectation is for payment, for you and the passenger, things go smoothly. That's the purpose. So you have to post the fare. We don't say how much you charge. We don't say that you know you can't charge two dollars a mile or whatever you want to charge. I don't even know what the charge is out there. But as long as people see, that's what police are going to look for. They're just going to look for that you have it posted and it's visible to a consumer prospective passenger. You could switch it, you know, every day. If it's like if you're, you know, I hate to say it, as long as it's visible and it's clear. If you, it doesn't say you can't switch it or. For, for the record, I've never had a problem with this. But in theory, then, you can say it's like, uh, I don't charge anything more than a million dollars a mile. Yeah. But that's not really posting the fare. It's just, you know, that's a little too, that's a little extreme. It's not giving notice to the passenger or the what to expect. Like, what are the expectations of the passenger? How much are they getting? You don't want to get into an argument with them at the end. You know, well, and so I mean, if, even horseshoe on carriage yeah. operators, we ask them to do the same. They have to post their fare schedule. So you know, if if you're going to charge more for certain events, as long as before the event it's there, that's what you're going to charge. That's fine. If you want to have a specific kind of warning that you know you would suggest that, that for instance, uh, I have a uh, twenty dollars twenty dollars per person per mile, extremely negotiable. Is that satisfactory? Um, I, I, right now, let me see, I'm just going to look at the section, what it says about the fares. So we don't get into what you want to charge people, it just it has to be posted. So what you're saying is basically it's $20 per person per fare, which seems a little extreme, but you're always going to well, go yeah, down. I mean, if, if people, that I guess people won't expect it, you charging $30 per person, exactly. right? I mean, I would try and be reasonable as possible and close to what you are expecting to charge for that event or that day. So if it's a busier day, you know, you could have more than one fare sheet, but the, the, 
the problem is, is you need to make it uniform. So you're not charging like, arbitrarily whatever you want, depending on the passenger. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's. Well, then, then why wouldn't you be able to put up a sign that would say all fares will be negotiated prior to departure? Because it's, then you don't have anything in writing or like something that's written what the fare is going to be. Okay. Because then if, if it's going to be your word against them, let's say you do negotiate, right? And then there's an argument at the end. You have nothing in writing. At least if you have something to point, it actually protects you. You have something to point to. You know, here's my notice that I told you it's going to be $50 flat for this. It could be a flat rate. It could be per mile. It could be per per. But then you have something to point to because that's the... You know, we're trying to avoid the situations where there's, I don't know, have you guys experienced that? That there's arguments at the end? We've seen it happen, but it's because the person didn't make their page legible or they, it's, the, the other so student the says it's 15 to $25 per person, but it doesn't actually say how much it really is. And then, and then they sit there and they argue, no, I said 25 per person. And you're like, dude, no. So see, it, it, it happens. Why would you not have a flat rate? Because these guys like to rip people, not this guys, but. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, so you, you could you have, have a flat rate, rate or you could have it per month. Conditions. There's, there's hillier areas, there's weather conditions, there is. Uh, you, know, uh, you also don't know their destination sometimes. Some some might be longer than others. Actually, it's actually gets more expensive because you're going a longer distance. Uh, there's, there's, uh, so there's, there's a demand. Mile. I've seen people do rates per mile. I mean, but you have to post it because it's just going to avoid you getting into that kind of conflict where the cops have to get involved to figure that out. I, I think if you post the rate, if you do more or less you expect, and you're very upfront with the customer and tell them, this is how much it is, do you agree, will you want the service? And if the customer agrees and sees the posting, and there's never a problem. I mean, right. That's, that's been my experience doing this for a long time in Chicago. Right. As long as you're at from the customer and tell them, to go here is going to be this much, we like the service. Right. And the customer can say yes or no. Most, you know. And you have something to point to at yeah, the yeah, end I, of the I, ride, too, and yeah, if there's so a conflict. Right. right. It protects you, too. And most of the time, sometimes it's less what you post it. Like, I would, let's say, for example, I said it's $12 per person, and I said to the person, you know, we'll take what, take less, I'll take 10, if you want to give me more, it's fine. You know, uh, would that be okay, or it has to be what is posted in there? I mean, I think you could go down, you just really can't go up, otherwise that causes a conflict, and then you're not giving the consumer enough notice. I, most of the time we go down in the fair, and if they want to give us more, it's great, if they don't, Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, me, I, should, I would, kind of want to propose like not only should you have a fare posted that the passenger should be made aware of and they should know it's there, but also tell them the actual like tell them what like agree on the price verbally or in writing whatever before you take the ride before you, you know before you get on the ride not just for a tour just for any ride because um, I think. What's, what I've seen, and like, you know, what Bobby mentioned, is like this past, you know, last weekend, there were people who had fares posted, passengers, ignored, like, they, did, they didn't tell them that the fare was even there. Passengers didn't know that the fare was even posted. They took a ride, they put them a certain fare. It may, it may have been within the parameters of the fare, but the passenger wasn't made, made aware of, like, how much it was going to cost ahead of time. And, you know, granted, they didn't ask, but that, that, Sort of conflict, so I think it should be up to the it should be the responsibility of the driver to say like, okay, well here's my post fare, and then you know, but then also just kind of have something an agreement beforehand. I mean that's fair as long as you're really not going above the posted fare. Yeah. I mean the posted fare can be a guideline, but you could if you you know especially if you're looking for fares and you know I could see people discounting the fare whatever you could do whatever you want you're your own business person. Is that that's just a consumer protection element where we want people to know and to avoid conflict at the end of the ride. Because you do all that work, you bike all these people around, and then you don't get paid, or the cops have to get involved. It's not worth it. But they're saying <laughs> people are posting fares, and they're just sort of concealing that they're even there. Pardon? They're posting their fares, but they're sort of concealing that they're even there. I wonder if things will change, though, once those license plates go in effect, and there's more enforcement. 
because a lot of this stuff is happening from our Eastern European counterparts. Okay. And so it's just like go write like one hand write fair and then put it in a baggie and put it underneath your seat. You don't even know what that is, but when you can't read it, you know. So I think that'll change quite a bit. Like there's real enforcement going on. So that's the same kind of said that we're not getting real enforcement right now. We're get, we got a little bit of enforcement in the beginning, and then now it's like. We don't really want to be shipped out either, you know. But there's, there's definitely, you know, dudes that are getting away with it right now that shouldn't be. Let's not make this a tool. Yeah, we're finding us our things, please. Sure. I didn't say anything. Okay. Any other questions? You know, I just had one other comment, final comment, about the uh, visibility of the pricing. In addition to the providing transparency to the consumer and protecting the business owner, it's a good thing to have in place a set rate for business planning, yes. cash flow management, all of that. Right. So, is that, you know, what she's saying is, is true. It just helps you plan your day and your business practices, but, you know, there's nothing that says you're, you know, glued to that fair structure for the whole week or the, the whole season. You know, it doesn't say that. It just says that, you know, I, there are going to be some events that are going to be more lucrative than others. And if you're going to have, you know, but it also depends on your competition. Are you the only one there? Or, you know, or you got to, like, you know, haggle for prices because there's 50 of you. So that's something that you're going to have to decide. But it has to be posted, though, before you got somebody coming in. And it, the police are going to be looking for that when they start enforcement. They're going to look for the fair structure. When they're looking at licensing, they're going to look at the whole vehicle. They're going to look for the license plate, the decal. The um, and the fair posting. When, when I was asking the question, I, I, I didn't mean to sound obtuse. My whole uh, the reason for asking the question was to help me figure out the best way to word, you know, the fair structure. I understand that you know you want to put a rate up, but you're not going to go above. That's the that's right. the main. So when we do the rules and regs, it'll probably be a little more clarification. There might even be language about the size of the, the sign, things like that. Right now, there's nothing in place for that. Okay. We're probably going to see what we see you know, in the industry. We're going to assess. That's why the rules, there's no, sometimes when there's a new license, we don't do rules and regs right away. We have to figure out you know, how is the you know, what's going on in the industry. We have to take into account practical aspects of the industry and what is in practice and then incorporate that. We are not going to mm -hmm. arbitrarily make, make rules and regs. Like, I don't drive a pedicab. I don't know what the fare is going to look like. I'm not going to make that up. It's, we're going to look and see what people are doing and incorporate that. You know, and see, okay, well, well, you like this guy's sign. We like the size of it. We like the font. We, you know, this guy's sign is great. But that one we can't read. So it might be, you know, we might have to, sometimes we specify, you know, it has to be, you know, minimum 10 point font or whatever. So it's visible, things like that. Is this something that we're going to have to uh, you know, show, show you what we're. No, it's going to be an enforcement on the field. You don't have to show us oh, your fair okay. structure. Okay. It's going to be on the field. Like okay. when, you, when you're out there, that's what investigators and police will look for. Okay. Yes. Um, when, the, when we have our police and everything, Theoretically, like if somebody can call 311 on us if they want to complain about something, right? To save the taxi cabs? Yes. How does the process work if, if somebody calls 311 to report me? Like, what, and then I get a notice, like, what, how does that work? Okay, so right now, um, we. We also take complaints about other public passenger vehicles, even now, like horse and carriages. We get complaints about. Um, not that many, but we do get some, and then even water taxis and uh, any public passenger vehicle because you're licensed by the city. So what happens is somebody calls 301 and then they say, I want to report a pedicab. There's going to be a drop down for the pedicab, the 301 operator. Um, like right now, there's a, um, a category called cab complaint. There'll probably be a, a pedicab category. There'll be a sequence of questions. Do you know the pedicab license number? Things like that. And they'll say, well, what happened? It's usually a narrative. Um, you know, then it's referred to an investigator. An investigator will look at it. They might, if they can identify who the, you know, um, the, per the person that's filing a complaint, they'll probably interview them, find out what happened, things like that. I mean, you know, it, it's good to have very strong customer service skills to deal with those situations so you don't get complaints. I mean, I have to tell you, in the horse-drawn industry, we don't get complaints about actual, um, like the, sh the person, the horse-drawn chauffeur, the only complaints we get is it's too hot for the horses or it's too cold for the horses. <laughs> so, I mean, so they know how to, that's a very small industry, there's only 25 of them. They know how to interact and not get complaints about overcharging, things like that, with consumers and things like that. 
That actually brings to mind a, 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 a instance that happened to me once in a week to brief. A guy tried to hail me, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not taking any rides right now, I'm on my way to one event. And he started, you know, berating me and you know, like asking me for, you know, what is my driver number and this and that as if I was a cab and I was obligated in one way or another to take him to where he wanted to go just because I was driving a conveyance. Uh, is that something I'm gonna have to worry about in the future? It, How many it, times did that happen? It's happened once. I've all, actually, it also happened with a really drunk. So I mean, if it's happened once, how long have you been a pedicab operator? Well, that's that, that's kind of immaterial. I'm wondering if eventually that might be a problem because I know uh, cab drivers have to take people. If they get right. There's well, you can refuse you can refuse service based on a lot of protected grounds. Okay. Okay, um, things like that. But if you're not for hire, then just put a sign up that you're not for hire. That's what cabs are supposed to do. Okay. You could say not for hire. I mean, you don't have a top light, so you could say you're not for hire. Okay. I don't know. But I mean, if it only happened yeah. once, I wouldn't stress out about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's just trying to cover, just trying to cover the base. No, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Any other questions? I hope this has been helpful for all of you. Thank you for coming today. Any, any other questions? Um, I would just recommend in future pedicab workshops we not have them at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> we'll take that. that that's hard, hard for us in the industry to get up that early. All right, we'll keep, we'll keep that in mind. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming.